Good afternoon and welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillis, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School, Washington University in St. Louis. So happy to have you with us on just really a remarkable day and a very special event. For folks joining us on Zoom, we're using a webinar format. That means we can't see or hear the audience, but the chat feature is enabled. And please keep on doing what you've been doing, which is sending in your greetings, letting us know who you are, where you're coming from. It's a mini Brown School alumni reunion going on in the chat, and, and please keep that coming. For folks that are joining us on YouTube, we are so delighted you're here and we're not able to moderate the YouTube chat. So um, thank you for, for still being a part of today's event. I wanna thank and acknowledge Cynthia Williams, the Brown School's Assistant Dean for Community Partnerships also here to help support just this very special event. Before we get started, I wanna let you know a couple things going on with Open Classroom. Um, we are taking a little bit of a hiatus. We've got Brown School Summer Institute coming up in the next couple weeks, so it's a busy time for us. But we are returning. Uh, the outpouring and the support for the series has been just so strong. So returning on Tuesday, July 6th, we'll be running programs weekly like through the end of the fall semester. So if you haven't visited our website recently, I'll throw a link in the chat, but there's so much interesting, good conversations coming your way. And I wanna encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity. But today is really, really special. And it's not every day we get to celebrate 50 years of service, leadership, impact. Um, today's event is part of acknowledging and celebrating Jack Kirkland's service to the Brown School community. And I'm one of the many people participating in this program who had the privilege of being a student of Professor Kirkland. We've joked that we're still students of Professor Kirkland's and always will be. Um, I really do remember his class as a defining moment for some of my own decisions about the impact that I wanna have. And I'm really happy to be here supporting the event. And to get our program started, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mary McKay, the Nidor Family and Centene Corporation Dean for the Brown School. Thank you, Janet. And thank you all for organizing this event. Professor Kirkland, congratulations. Um, it is my privilege uh, to welcome um, all in attendance here to celebrate your 50 years of contributing to communities locally across the nation uh, to the professions of social work, public health, policy, uh, to the academy. Um, professor, you know, we're gonna hear from a his, uh, history, that we're gonna hear that you're a history maker, that's true. We're gonna hear that you're a change maker, that's true. I think you're a life alterer because there are people that are uh, sending you greetings in the chat that your class, the relationship they had with you changed their perspective, changed their minds and changed their behavior, changed their commitment. Um, you're a fearless social justice and racial justice advocate and leader, and you challenge us to do better every day. So you're gonna hear from me later in a videotaped message, but I just wanna say congratulations. Um, I wanna say that it's been a privilege to know you and to be mentored by you and support and advance your important work. And I can hardly wait to hear what, uh, what you're gonna say to us today and then our panelists are gonna say as well. So thank you, Jack, for everything that you do to transform lives. Professor Kirkland, please join me in welcoming Jack. Now, Jack, in the world of Zoom, I'm gonna to have to tell you that you have to unmute yourself so we can hear your wise, wise words. Okay. Very okay. soon, I will never have to say those words again. <laughs> thank you, Jack. Oh, thank you, thank you very much for that great introduction. And I'm, I'm very, very honored to have had uh, so many wonderful students who are with me uh, at this moment. Um, and I'm going to, um, do some things that, that they know I never do, and that is read. Uh, they have, most of my students are in class with me from uh, two, three, or four hours, and they will never see me come in with a piece of paper. But I, in the, in the interest of, of time and, and the interest of the great uh, people who are with me, 
uh, today and on the panel, I want to just kick up some dust uh, and, and throw some ideas and some thoughts out there and read a few abstracts from what I was going to uh, speak and, and perhaps even uh, make available what I have written uh, to the audience, uh, perhaps if they could uh, make that possible. But let me just uh, uh, say and begin by stating that there are and were a number of subjects that flashed across my mind as I prepared for this event. Um, they, they moved almost like asteroid uh, uh, motion. And uh, specifically what I decided uh, to speak on um, was going to be critical race theory. I'm sure that um, you all have some thoughts about that. And I'm, 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 I'm wanting to very much uh, talk about how critical uh, race theory literally becomes the foundation uh, for institutionalized racism. It undergirds it. Um, and you may not see it or think about it as being the giant among us, but it really is because it undergirds everything that we see in the news, everything that we see uh, that in many instances represent violence against race. Um, and so I wanted to just put that on your mind as a, a, a factor of thought. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, I think that this can bring us close to uh, what we learned about in history of a place called Fort Sumter, uh, because there are these um, various uh, differences that not only that split along lines politically in this nation, but these issues uh, obviously split along families. So you see the subject is critical race theory, but it really could be the salvation of America. So the question is a very simple question that I would pose to you and is, do we agree with God? Simply, are we all created human beings and just that, human, human. There never were any created less or any created differently than being human. And on the basis of political expedience, um, some of this has changed. For instance, we talked about three fifths of a human being. Um, and because of, because of confrontation, and I guess some might call it generosity, we've been elevated to four-fifths of a human being. And as a result of this elevation, many might think that this is equal to being a full person. And so what we look at then is that there are many, many factors that are uh, plaguing the memories of, of us all. Um, and I wanted to uh, just uh, speak of a few in my early career that highly steamed me up uh, and, have, and have thought about this in terms of both towns, that is towns such as Greenwood uh, uh, as a community in Tulsa, <clears throat> in Tulsa Oklahoma and Rosewood and Florida. And the person who helped lead uh, Blacks out of the massacre in, in Rosewood, Florida, I had the distinction of my last name 
being named after him. And so this young boy led others out of, out of the trouble that was before them into the swamps <clears throat> and they avoided the massacre. Now I could name people that I posted and visibly horrifying pictures in the minds of some my age. Uh, and so I'll start first with, <clears throat> with Emmett Till. I could have given more secret uh, uh, information knowing something about his situation. I could have started with George Floyd. I could have started with Rihanna Taylor or stayed at home and mentioned um, uh, my, my individual that I know something about, Michael Brown. But these situations as reprehensible as they are, are still coming to the surface. And, and as they become more and more visible, uh, we began to see this leakage uh, into what are now hidden atrocities. And so <clears throat> I wonder if the next situation will generate smoke or explosion because they are manifestations of deeply embedded bubbling issues or marva flowing beneath in the volcanic core of institutionalized racism. And we could and should protest peacefully and demonstrate and confront and publicly witness against black violence on people of color peaceably, not only to that which is physical, but that which is at all levels, horizontal, vertical, and as we protest, we should do it peacefully. At home, here, and as we see it demonstrated abroad. And we need to um, protest basically because of what Blacks have experienced in this country and as a way of making the nation aware of the various kinds of beha behaviors that have come upon us as the evidence of chattel slavery. You see, Blacks were not considered as human beings. And even after building the prominence in this country and for doing the various kinds of labor that has been before them, uh, and every, every one of these situations uh, and evidences, Blacks have not progressed at the level of human status. And so I wanted to um, have us to take a look at why this is so and what precipitates such behavior. And when we come to look at it, we recognize that, that it exists unequally in every echelon of life, politically, socially, economically, and judicially. And the ju judicial system is the big giant in all of this, because if it were a just system, then what would happen is that this great mountain of institutionalized racism would be relegated to simply a molehill. When I arrived at um, Washington University 
1970 as the co-founder and associate director of Black Studies, there were many uh, uh, situations that I first encountered. One was that there were only a few Blacks here than those who were uh, led off the boat in Jamestown in 1619 in chains. Now, before you get heavily uh, um, angry about that situation, uh, remember that Washington University, like all other schools in the country, was in a similar uh, place, that there were just very, very few Blacks on ground. Our mission from, the, from my landing here to my takeoff was to educate students for the present and future. Students of all ethnicities and hues, the public system in America purports to be a place to enhance self-esteem for all. But for this to happen, truth has to be fully and firmly established. It has to be etched and honed in honest study and unbiased research. For education to achieve this ultimate purpose and goal, standard that it purports to set and subscribe and Jack, your microphone has gone muted for some reason. Let me, did I, can you? Yeah, about, about 10 seconds before, uh, if you, yeah, I want to back up to the beginning of the thought. Okay. Um, okay, then. Our mission then is, when I, when I landed here at Washington University, was to educate students for the present and future. Students of all ethnicities and hues, the, the public, school system in America purports to be a place to enhance self-esteem for all. But for this to happen, truth has to be fully and firmly established and etched in honest study and unbiased research. For education to achieve the ultimate purpose and goal, the basic standard that it purports to set and subscribe and professes to accomplish is nothing spectacular. All that is required is honest research, which is the hallmark of building knowledge for all disciplines. After my 50 years, along with social scholars across the world, I've come to discover that truth is yet hidden and forced to wear the disguise of critical race theory. This is like discovering that integration, school integration, is the same as school desegregation. And continue through, through the curriculum as though mixing oil and water after standing for a while just casually agrees to separate. Well, I recall a lad, a strange uh, thing happened to him on his way to the first grade. It would have happened earlier, but we were too poor uh, in my small Appalachian village to have a kindergarten. And while we lived in separate segregated parts of our little village, poverty prevented us from having separate segregated schools. But in this racially mixed environment, the same thing kept happening to me from grade to grade as I was getting ready for each grade uh, level. And year after year that I was getting ready for what was happening around me, within me and to me, it seemed like I was 
passing school with flunking life and missing my turn to get into the mainstream where I wanted and was promised to be seemed equal uh, to all others um, that were in that same stream. But I found out that I was not permitted to get into that stream because the admission key was pigmentation. And as the director of Black Studies, looking back and reading more broadly into the chronology of literature that I was previously denied and could not find to read about my own heritage, cultural, historical experiences, this revelation now being accentuated to me by both Black and white historians, scholars, I, be, I became intellectually aware of what was personally I was personally experiencing and why I had these feelings of such excruciating thoughts that I was undergoing. And the reason, and the reason I could not defend myself and my youth and parity as equal to other human beings who are my white peers and later when I fully realized that all of the movements abroad from the civil rights, the one I fully involved in and was a participant to Black Lives Matter, <clears throat> one in which I have great sympathy, was I fully able to interpret the underlying reasons for the behavior offered and the offense of it uh, to me. So I recently gave a talk of Black History Month and I compiled a great number of those ideas and thoughts within that context. And I would like very much for you to uh, perhaps uh, see if you can get that paper uh, from the school. You know, just to show you how, how, how rigidly Im, Im, and, and how rigidly uh, embedded uh, these, these school experiences are, I, I actually uh, found uh, that it's, that it's what's, I actually found in public school that the stories <laughs> And, and the information and history that you're exposed to rests with you uh, on and on and on. For instance, you can put a, a badge or a camera on the um, chest of a police officer and that police officer is going to reflect the schooling that he or she experienced and the treatment of the individual that is before them. And those experiences last and stay, they're permanent and they are the, they are the things that we relate to. You know, it's, it's, it's very, easy to reckon how this is so because uh, both blacks and whites experience the same information. But what happens uh, with, with whites is, is that they have the option of, of checking out of that system because it really is not um, causing them to recoil as a result of the stories, because the stories are told uh, about them, uh, the stories supplant and 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 encourage them, and the stories, uh, for many, actually are not just stories; uh, they are truths uh, in print. And so, the question often uh, came up to me was. Uh, as I was seeking employment in universities was um, 
how how did I relate to the information that I was exposed to? How did I relate to that? And my answer, of course, was in the dialogue. And that is that I saw myself in a situation where uh, I was being talked to and I was not included in the story that was being talked about. And, and actually, uh, after close examination, uh, I discovered that my existence was not even a known factor uh, to the literature uh, that I was exposed to. And to uh, put a, a um, more emphasis on, on this lack of exposure, uh, I was expected <clears throat> uh, to uh, enjoy the status apparently, and not only that, but to pay for that enjoyment in movies and to be seen as a buffoon. And that was a, a factor where it obviously meant that this was an in, in, in expectation that was grooved into responses of my color. You know, we will be demonstrating and falling short of being good citizens to one another as long as we keep drinking from this, the same well, this public school curriculum. Every generation sees the same pictures, even when the pictures of students in the first grade books now are in different shades of color. The story is still painted, slanted, and the picture show is directed with the same cast of stars who always decide the state curriculum, their truth of the winners and heroes. And you can put cameras on the vests of black police and you will find that they having been caught up in that story, will be treating the people that they stop, black and white, somewhat different. Until we learn common sense, that is the common sense of black, brown, white, and the children of those of people of color, we will always um, behave in a way where we express the full boldness of this ignorance, where we come to live and express this ignorance among ourselves. And so the, 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 the thing that, that we need to do is to learn to carry out what we knew as very young people. <clears throat> and what we knew um, was that we didn't know race. And what we knew is that we didn't uh, react to it even in the sandbox. And so it took a long time for us to arrive at a point where we began to make these differences and pigmentation uh, uh, observations. And we recognize that um, the separation that has accompanied it has made us, um, in many instances, unembraceable to one another. And so <clears throat> I would like to just think about uh, being here for 50 years and enjoying my jubilee. After 50 years with Washington University, I've seen both time and change at my disposal. We see marked advantages 
and visible differences. But I thought after all this time that I should be standing here and sitting here now and seeing and reading signs stating a more perfect union just over the hill. Or you would have thought that progress, especially in such highly digitally invested in social media society with citizens uh, expressing ability to relate uh, even uh, in isolation of these situations. But I didn't see that. Uh, Jack, you've gone muted again. The last thing we heard you say was that you didn't see that. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, okay, let me go from there then. I thought that within this time of 50 years that I would have heard the GIS lady sound out perfect union just ahead on the right and that we all tired and weary travelers of 401 years, many of us cooped up in tightly uh, interracial and a personal groups would have found release and relief. We would be embarking and, and stating or laughing and embracing one another, talking about the rough roads that we've traveled and how we have misread some of the instructions along the way. But we all got here. And just how we have misread some of the instructions along the way, but we got here. And that we could tell others time and change does not constitute progress. And that delays only make the journey more grueling and frustrating and how we almost came blows and risk losing the union because equity was mistaken for advantage and truth as a way for others to seek revenge. We could talk of how on such a journey you can and will feel that you will be forever lost and seeking or reaching the destination of amicable relationships. That in our rancor with one another, we lost all road signs and lost our direction several times. And then, and when it radically occurred to us that we might possibly lose our nation, this seemed such a sobering wake up that the awakening brought us back together. The thought of facing the truth and taking the remedy, truth, could not make it more bitter to the taste than the thought of hearing and bearing the disease institutionalized racism. And heavy, the heavy weight of the terrible consequences, the terrible after effects of refusal, yes, refusal, to take the medicine of anti-racism. This is a Herculean work ahead of us, the salvation of our nation, both secular and non-secular have to be involved, both institutions and, inst and individuals have to be supportive uh, in the demise of racism. And I would 
suggests that we take up the mantle, ready or not, and each to his defined common purpose. Yes, take the medicine, uh, because after 401 years of pain and misery, the only hurt is that we had the remedy here all the time, but this was a country that learned to live with pain and misery for so long that many have accepted pain and misery as a way of life. We have the choice of taking the vaccination of anti-racism, or we have the choice of refusal. We have the choice of both consequences that are before us. And I think the truth is the one to take because that way I know we will save not only the union, but we will save relationships in this country because in families, people sit across the dinner table with different perspectives about this issue. And I would like very much to uh, enjoin uh, my panel and ask them pointedly, uh, what was your impression of your um, first grade to the, let's say, to, let's say to high school? And what if you had read and been exposed to history from that point up until uh, high school with no public, no audience, all you had was history? What would be your perspective when you first saw a black person? Philip, what would you say? Did you, did you hear the question? Yes, I did. And, and, and <laughs> okay, it's, uh, um, thing, huh? I wanted to say, first of all, thank you, Professor Kirkland, uh, and congratulations um, on this remarkable um, year of celebration. And, um, and I think you've impacted all of us to think like this in the classroom. And this is open classroom for all uh, Brown School alums. And I remember uh, this question is, um, would me being, going back to your question, me being in that position of not um, only having history and encountering um, a black person for the first time um, and just having gone through grade school all the way to high school, what would be my reaction be or what would be my approach be? Um, and, and that's what, one of the comments that I prepared was that uh, we only know by, in, my, in our knowledge base of of those people as something as, dif as different as, as we are to them. And there's a huge distance in this abstract world of uh, encountering knowledge as someone equ equating that knowledge to a person, a per particular of per of particular race or coming from history. And that's where I, I, I would question my, uh, even my own knowledge, whether I even truly know the person as a brother and sister. Uh, and that is where I would be falling short of even being able to encounter at all with any type of reaction. I would be angered. I would be um, saddened. I would be um, frustrated uh, as a as a brother, as a, as a, to the person. Uh, at the same time, I would question my privilege of how I have come to that space, that position, and how can I share my journey alongside with. The person that I've only known uh, in my head as, as 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 part of the knowledge base that I learned through history, so that's the um, that's where I I would sort of the distance has to be uh, one of have, have be have to be bridged by one of the narrative of we. Uh, that's the only way that I have figured out from uh, leaving your class in 1999 all the way to now for over 20 years, just struggling in the community particularly black communities who've taught me to be a better human um, and to 
to only kind of keep keep it as, as a history of knowledge is going to be short lived uh, for what I, I, I could do in terms of encountering with truth and gen, um, genuine heart. And that's kind of my initial reaction, but I don't know if that would, that's a, that's a conversation starter for all of us. Uh, many of them are also listening who are Professor Kirk, Kirkland students who could be well qualified to be in this panel, but I hopefully that's a, my initial reaction can start some conversations. So thank you. Yes, uh, and, and Philip, would you would you give us a a quick um, a, a quick uh, brief of, of of your bio? Tell us in, in simple words. What simple, you... simple words. Um, I my bio is I'm a professor Kirkland student um, <laughs> and always will be and still am. I wish I could be in the classroom every day uh, and waiting. Um, in, in front of your office to 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 your for your doors to open, uh, but my currently I'm at Loyola University of Chicago as a, a professor and associate dean for research in the School of Social Work, and I continue to live out the spirit of of Professor Kirkland's teaching in my work in the community and on the South Side and West Side of Chicago, and working in primarily African American Black communities and who are all my teachers uh, teaching me every day to continue to live out the mission of racial equity. And that's kind of in a short bio, uh, but I will just say uh, for, for the foremost, I'm Professor Kirkman's student. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm turning to you then, Jen, because you, you seem to be the, the, the senior in my student category here. So you want to make a, <laughs> make a response? Yeah, I'm one of the original Jack Kirkland students. <laughs> uh, I'm Ken Cooper. I'm a senior editor at uh, WGBH, which is an NPR and public television station in Boston. Uh, I work with radio and digital news uh, after a long career in newspapers that included Coming at age 28, the youngest African American to win a Pulitzer Prize for journalism. Just a few years ago, that was. Um, and I reported and wrote those stories as part of a team. But my work was very much informed by the lessons I learned about institutionalized racism in Jack Kirkland's Black Studies 201 at Washington University in the fall of 1973. And in fact, his lessons were so deeply embedded in me that when the editors first asked me to work on this project, I held out until I got assurances that we would take a look at the institutions of racism, not personal feelings, personal prejudice, that sort of thing. And it's kind of an irony that, you know, my editor in the end has persuaded me, uh, but had he not, I would have taken a pass and pushed my excuse not to be involved, which I had several that I tried out, tried to get out of it. Um, so I want to thank Jack for that. And even I'm already of retirement age, at least theoretically, but I still hear Professor Kirkland in the back of my head at times. I heard it when I worked at a major American newspaper and all of a sudden my department and my job disappeared. I heard Professor Kirkland in the back of my head saying, or telling me, this is the part where you get to be a spare part, disposed of by a corporation. Uh, at the same newspaper, I heard him in my head when a good friend of mine, an African-American, <clears throat> who was the number three editor and was in line to become uh, the editor-in-chief uh, of the newspaper, got passed over. And for the first time in 100 years, that newspaper hired an editor-in-chief from outside its own ranks. Jack Kirkland in my head, defining institutionalized racism. Whenever African-Americans get close to power, the rules change. So Jack, thank you for those lessons, and thank you for continuing to teach those lessons for the decades that you've taught. And I also want to congratulate you on your endurance and perseverance to be at the same institution 
teaching young people for five decades. That's remarkable. Appreciate it, Ken. <clears throat> and I'll... Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no I'll, 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 I'll get back to you. Yeah. Well, on your question, uh, so please rephrase the question for me shortly, and I want to, well, in brief yeah. terms, I want to I respond to your question. Okay. The question was, if you were uh, a, a individual from in school, uh, public school at the, oh, at the, let's say the first grade to, to uh, uh, high school. And all you were exposed to was the information that you read and, 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 and that you digested as a result of that uh, elementary and secondary school experience. And you saw a black for the first time, what would be your impression? Well, you know, the first black person I would probably see in that circumstance would be myself in the mirror. And if that's all I knew, I wouldn't think very much of myself. And the structure is designed to have that kind of effect. Um, fortunately for me, um, I did have in the fourth grade, African-American teacher, a woman who was from Little Rock, Arkansas, and gave us some very basic black history lessons, excuse me, third grade, Louise Smith, gave us some very basic um, lessons in black history, including the Little Rock Nine, because she was from Little Rock and she was very proud of what had happened there. Um, and the second thing that sort of changed my trajectory is that quite by accident, well, not accident, but without my taking any effort, I wound up integrating a private school in my hometown of Denver. And from there, I went to one of the nation's most prestigious boarding schools. Which boarding school had many rules, not enough diversions. I spent a lot of my evenings reading all the African-American protest literature of the 60s. I read virtually all of it. And, but what you did for me, Jack, was when I wrote, wrote your class, I sort of had this feeling of what was right. You put it into a conceptual framework that made me go, aha. It's been with me ever since. So thanks again. Okay. Uh, the next uh, panelist is an individual I want to just make a couple statements about before I ask her. Uh, because uh, her father uh, is primarily responsible for me sitting here. Um, I came, as I said, from a very small village and her father, of course, is in that village. And he, he presented such a, a image to us uh, of, of what you can do regardless to what people will try to stop you from doing. Uh, and he, he, he got a special name from us, which was Noble. <laughs> we, we, we loved him. And he was our Pied Piper. He was the one who led us out of that village into another world. So uh, I, I, I preface that as I ask uh, Juliana if she would speak to uh, what I have asked uh, other panelists. I want, well, thank you. I want to say congratulations on 50 years. And I also want to say that I'm the uh, Brown Brown School cl class, Blythe, Blythedale, which is the <laughs> town uh, that uh, you and my father came from and that I um, visit, you know, grew up in for a period of my life and visited afterwards. And it was the, the backwoods of, of uh, Pennsylvania, you know, a mill town mm -hmm. and uh, where people would come out um, from the mill fighting on Friday nights. Um, and in many ways, people would say that it was, you know, a place that went nowhere. But when I look at you, I see my father and he would be so proud. Um, of the lives that you have touched 
and the impact you've had and that you've actually taken and made, as he always envisioned, the, the classroom, the laboratory for improving society. You know, I, when you were talking about passing school and flunking life, you know, in many ways, your life has been a life of excellence and um, an example and example of fortitude of what people can dream to be and to, in many ways, helping melt the American melting pot that not has yet melted yet. So you asked me that question. That question is what my life was really, because um, when we left, we moved to a town um, called Newark, Ohio, um, where I was the only black kid in my class. And, um, and I just couldn't reconcile because um, we studied slavery in George Washington Carver. And my nine-year-old brain couldn't conceive that he could have done all those things with peanuts. And white people were saying that he had done all those things with peanuts when all we had ever been were slaves. And so the work that I do now came out of that classroom um, because I could, because I could not, I had no idea what black people were capable of doing. And so the world that we exist in right now and the institutional race, racism, I don't necessarily believe now in the, the times that we are now that the stain of racism can be wiped away. I believe that you can grow up around it and hopefully we can grow up around it, non-racist around but I think that it's in the, the DNA of this nation. Um, I am the founder of an organization called the History Makers. We interview black people about their lives. We've grown to be the nation's largest African-American video oral history archive. And you've heard me speak about the importance of papers and documentary evidence. And, as I speak, I'm so proud that WashU is going to is your repository now, Professor Kirkland. <laughs> okay. I am so proud that that has manifested because if we don't have representations of our successes, then we don't have documentation of our value. And no one, no one, what is being talked about who, who has value and who doesn't have value and you're leaving in the people that you've taught and in your work and now within the archives of WashU, a university that you have contributed so much to, you're leaving evidence of what you've, of your contributions and I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate uh, all of you, of course. Uh, it's, it's, it's just fascinating that you uh, are are here with me. I, I just wish that uh, this was not uh, remote. I wish we could actually be uh, standing close to one another. Um, and so uh, let me just ask if we we have about uh, five minutes uh, left. If you have a just want a, a, a last closing statement um, briefly. Who, who first? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, we'll okay. go. We'll I'll go say, I'm sorry. I'll say, I'll say this that, um, and this is more in tribute. I want your work to live on because the work of your last 50 years will be much needed as if for the present that we are experiencing the future that we hope it to be. Thank you. Um, I'll say a couple of things. Uh, Juliana, you remind me of another Jack Kirklandism when I was in his class. When he said, you're going to be successful, black students, you're going to be successful despite racism. In other words, to sort of 
let us know that it was a part of the terrain. I like to say it's institutionalized racism is like a barometric pressure that only operates on people of color. I am though, Juliana, a bit more optimistic than you about the ability to ring racism, at least out of the core of the society. And I say that in part because I had the experience of living and reporting on India for three years, where their caste system, somewhat analogous to American racism, is 3,000 years old. And buttressed explicitly by religious texts. And they actually look up to African Americans, low caste Indians, because of our advancement. And I think if you look at it in a global context, we have a better chance of uprooting American racism than, for example, in India, you have a chance of dispatching. And I would just continue the, those thoughts by saying um, this is my commitment to continue on uh, following the footsteps of Professor Kirkland in the next 50 years of uh, continuing the legacy um, and committing to uh, launching a serious effort to center Blackness, Black experiences, Black strength, um, wealth of history, and greatness as the necessary strategy to ensure economic liberation for all Americans. I think that is what uh, Professor Kirkland has always taught us, how we could rise together by not reacting to racism, but one to uproot it by rising through, piercing through all those that by focusing on our strengths and building the institutions around to combat the very institutions that have been uh, keeping us muted keeping us locked up, keeping us aside and ex excluded. And those by doing that, the building the institutions of economic uh, development and also the policies that support it and the community resources around it, that by uh, fighting the forces that have always kind of been where the second, we've been put in the secondary citizen category to one that we are the primary focus in, in development and growth for all Americans. So I, that's my dedication and commitment to follow your footsteps, Professor Kirkland. Well, we can all, we can all see that uh, what has happened now is, is that we're beginning a seminar. This is, this is, this is almost openness, right? You know, as I used to tell you, you know, that it takes an hour for me to clear my throat. So uh, I'm just, just very excited about this opportunity to have you share with me uh, my jubilee. Uh, I, I, I couldn't, I, I, there are so many, many, many students out there that I really, really am so close to, uh, but you represent them and you represent them well. I thank you. Professor Kirkland, thank you so much for your contributions to our community. It, it feels weak to say it in, in just those terms, but thank you for letting us celebrate you today. And, and the panel did such a beautiful job, um, ably representing the, the many uh, students and lives you've touched and all the ways that you've had impact. You know, normally here on Open Classroom, we do kind of a a quick end, we say that's the end of the program, but I'm gonna keep the feed live for just a minute or two longer um, because I want to encourage anybody who hasn't participated in the chat yet, who wants to send in a message of congratulations or a memory um, to please do so. Uh, we'll save the chat and then let Jack review it later. Uh, but um, anybody else have any other closing comments before we just sort of end the program, but leave the feed live so that the, the folks can send in their messages. All right, well, with that, um, thank you to, thank you to uh, you, Professor Kirkland, to all who joined us for this beautiful celebration. Um, and 
we hope to see you again very soon and hopefully in person soon to, to celebrate together. Um, so please do continue to, to send in your congratulations. We've got Ken joining us, Madeline, Cynthia, your student for life. I love that. <laughs> All right, everybody, please stay healthy and safe, and we'll see you soon. Take care.